Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about allergy in children. Allergy is a type of hypersensitivity reaction of the immune system, so a reaction that is greater than it usually should be. Allergies can involve more than one type of reaction and are targeted against antigens that don't usually pose a threat to the body. Allergens can include substances as pollen, dust mites, mold spores, insect stings, food, medicines and many more. Risk factors to develop an allergy are divided into host factors and environmental factors. Host factors include hereditary causes, gender, race and age, while environmental factors include infectious diseases in early childhood, pollution, allergen levels and changes in the diet. Now we will talk about what a hypersensitivity reaction is. It is the undesirable reaction of the immune system and includes allergies but also autoimmune disorders. For a hypersensitivity reaction to occur, the host, in this case a child, has to encounter the allergen for the first time. This is called presensitization. There are four types of hypersensitivity reactions based on the mechanisms that are involved and the time it takes for the reaction to occur. It is possible for several types to occur in one disease. The type 1 hypersensitivity is the one that is usually responsible for allergies. The immune cells that are responsible for this type are immunoglobulins of the type E, which bind the mast cells on their FC receptor. When the specific allergen binds to the IgE antibody, it initiates degranulation of the mast cells and so the release of histamine. This type has an onset of reaction within one hour. The type 2 hypersensitivity reaction is the cytotoxic type. Here a IgG or IgM antibody binds to a cellular antigen which leads to the activation of the complement system and cell lysis. IgG antibodies also mediate the reaction of T cells, natural killer cells, macrophages and neutrophils. This type is usually seen in the lysis of red blood cells after a mismatched blood transfusion in graft rejections and in the good pasture syndrome. This reaction occurs in hours to days. The type 3 hypersensitivity reaction is the immune complex type. Here antigen antibody complexes are deposited in the tissues which leads to activation of the complement system and the attraction of neutrophils to the site of reaction. This contributes to the pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases as for example systemic lupus erythematosus but also drug allergies as allergies to penicillin antibiotics and infectious diseases as post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, meningitis, hepatitis and malaria. This reaction usually occurs in one to three weeks. The fourth and last type is the delayed type. It occurs in days to weeks. It is mediated by T helper cells which are activated when an antigen presenting cell presents an antigen. The T helper cells then secrete cytokines which activate the macrophages and T cells and attract more macrophages to the site of reaction which causes an inflammatory response and tissue damage. This type is seen in contact dermatitis, chronic transplant rejection, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and celiac disease. A way to remember the four types and which type they are is the acronym ACID. So type 1 allergic, type 2 cytotoxic, type 3 immune complex and type 4 delayed. As we said allergies are usually caused by a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, which uses IgE immunoglobulins for the reaction. 
However, there is also the non-IgE mediated type. In the IgE mediated type, or the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, the allergen to which there is the overreaction generated can be either inhaled, swallowed or injected. An allergen can be pretty much any usually harmless substance and it can be either a complete protein antigen, as in the case of pollen, or a low molecular weight protein, as in the case of allergies to peanuts, egg white or cow milk. Here the allergy is caused by heat and acid stable glycoproteins. Atopy, another term that we use in the context of allergies, is the genetic predisposition to make IgE antibodies in response to allergen exposure. This can be in the sense of a classic allergy, but also an allergic rhinitis, asthma or atopic dermatitis. Several genes have been identified to cause atopy. So to recap it, atopy is the genetic predisposition to develop an exaggerated IgE response, and allergy is the actual hypersensitivity reaction to a specific allergen causing symptoms in a patient. Now we will talk about the mechanisms how allergies occur. With the first time exposure to an allergen, the immune system may only produce a mild reaction. Repeated exposure is what can, in certain circumstances, cause a severe reaction or even an anaphylactic shock. Once a person is sensitized, so has had a previous sensitivity reaction, even very, very small amounts of an allergen can cause a severe reaction. Most allergic reactions occur within minutes after exposure to the specific allergen. In some cases, it can be even after several hours, in very rare cases, after 24 hours. So in the identification of an allergen, the last 24 hours should be considered. Both mast cells and basophils are involved in the process of an IgE-mediated type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Those cells have a high affinity for the IgE cell membrane receptors on the surface of the IgE. T and B cells play an important role in the development of the IgE antibody, while the IgE antibody itself mediates the immediate hypersensitivity reaction. In the next part, we will talk about the spectrum of allergy and the clinical aspects of immediate hypersensitivity. Many different organs can be affected. There is of course the classic picture of an allergy that immediately comes to mind, with red eyes, a runny nose and itching red skin. This is part of it, but furthermore also the intestinal tract and lungs can be affected and there is the occurrence of the systemic immediate hypersensitivity or also called anaphylaxis. Affecting the nose and eyes as the main organs, we can consider in this spectrum the allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis and hay fever. They present with a runny nose, redness and itching of the eyes and are typically caused by pollen, so occur predominantly in spring, but depending on the tree or flower that causes it, it is also possible for it to occur all year long. The route of entry is typically contact with the mucous membranes. Considering the lung, asthma bronchiale is in this spectrum. It presents with wheezing, dyspneu and tachypneu. The allergen is typically inhaled and typical allergens are pollen, house dust and animal dandruff. If you want to know more about asthma in children, we have a separate video on that in our pediatrics playlist. The skin can also be affected and typically presents with atopic dermatitis and urticaria. The rash is usually itching, so pruritic, and presents with vesicular or bullous lesions. The allergen can be ingested or can enter the body in other different ways, and many allergens can cause this reaction as certain foods, medications or contact to plants. For the intestinal tract, an allergic gastroenteropathy can occur. It presents with vomiting and diarrhea and is typically caused by the ingestion of various foods. 
the systemic immediate hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis usually presents with wheezing, hypotension and shock, as well as swelling of the eyes and lips and is often caused by insect venom, medications as penicillin or foods as peanuts. Now we will talk more closely about food hypersensitivity. Here it is to differentiate between non-immune mediated hypersensitivity or food intolerance and immune mediated hypersensitivity also called food allergy. The non-immune mediated hypersensitivity or food intolerance is caused by enzymatic effects, pharmacological effects, direct effect on mast cells, toxic effects or it can be unidentified. In this spectrum are diseases as lactose intolerance, histamine intolerance or glutamate intolerance. Immune hypersensitivity or food allergy can be either IgE mediated or non IgE mediated. The non IgE mediated form can be mediated by IgGs, eosinophils, T helper cells, or it can occur in the setting of a contact allergy. Symptoms of a food allergy include allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, asthma, diarrhea, stomach cramps, vomiting pruritus, urticaria, conjunctivitis and anaphylaxis. The symptoms can range from chronic low-grade symptoms to acute life-threatening reactions. Symptoms for a food intolerance include migraine, headaches, joint pains, stomach pain, constipation, flatulence, aggression, hyperactivity, sound sensitivity, ear pain, fatigue and depression. The key components of a food allergy are the immunologic response to a food protein while food intolerances are usually related to carbohydrates. Also, really really small amounts of a food, like traces of peanuts in some sauce for example, can already cause a reaction and the reaction can be severe and even life-threatening. So to recap, the main features of a food allergy are protein-related, small amounts and severe reaction. Common food allergies in children are different than for adult age. In children it is common to be allergic to milk, eggs, peanut, soy, wheat and tree nuts, while in adults peanut and tree nuts occur as well, but also fish and shellfish. To diagnose a food allergy, we first have to obtain a detailed history. Then we want to figure out whether it is IgE mediated or non-IgE mediated. This is done by a blood test which measures the level of IgE in response to a specific food allergen. We can also do a skin prick test to see the skin reaction to different foods or we can ask the patient to make a diary about what they eat and how they feel after the consumption of different foods. We can also ask the patient to follow an el elimination diet. Here the patient gets a food plan which avoids one or sometimes two of the most common food allergy triggers. The patient is advised to leave them out of their diet for a while and then introduce them again as the challenge phase and see how in this leaving out and reintroducing the body reacts. Now we will talk about other forms of allergy. Atopic dermatitis is diagnosed by different criteria. For the diagnosis four of the following are necessary. First, early onset and typical localization of the skin lesions according to the age group. Second, pruritus. Third, personal or family history of atopy. Fourth, IgE mediated sensitization. Fifth, stigmata of atopy. So if four of these are present, a patient is said to have atopic dermatitis. Stigmata of atopy refers to a set of characteristics which include dryness of the skin, linear grooves on the fingertips, Denny Morgan fold, which is a double intraorbicular fold, hypodense lateral eyebrows, 
which are also called Queen Anne's eyebrows or Queen Anne's sign, as well as hypersensitivity to wool fabric. In infancy, the rash usually occurs on the cheeks, wrists and extensor aspects of the arms and legs. In young children aged 2 to 12, usually the flexor surfaces, the neck, wrists and ankles are involved. In teenagers and young adults, the flexor surfaces, face, hands and feet are usually affected. Now we will talk about allergic rhinitis. It is usually defined as a symptomatic disorder of the nose, which is induced by an IgE-mediated inflammation after the contact of an allergen to the membranes of the nose. It usually presents with coughing, sneezing, itching and congestion of the nose, also recurrent infections of the throat and in infants also respiratory distress. It often occurs concomitantly with sinusitis, asthma, otitis media, failure to thrive and obstructive sleep apnea. The clinical picture depends usually on the duration of the allergen exposure, the age of the child and the extent of the diseases it occurs with. This presentation is often missed to be diagnosed and children are often given multiple rounds of antibiotics before this disease is considered. Also a chronic cough often occurs in children which results from post-nasal drip and irritation of the larynx. Allergic rhinitis is diagnosed by a detailed personal and family allergic history, an intranasal examination, also called anterior rhinoscopy, the documentation of symptoms of other allergic diseases, a allergy skin test or in vitro specific IgE test, nasal secretion or scraping cytology, and sometimes a CT scan to look for anatomic abnormalities or a concomitant presence of sinusitis. In the last part we will talk about anaphylaxis. It is the sudden and severe systemic allergic reaction that occurs within minutes of exposure to an allergen. It requires immediate medical attention, as it can get worse really quickly and can lead to death within as little as 15 minutes if it is not treated. It can lead to swelling of the throat and tongue and to trouble of breathing. Other symptoms include dizziness, pruritus, GI symptoms as nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, urgency and sudden respiratory and or circulatory collapse. Patients may not be able to identify the allergen or they are unaware of the contact to it. In the identification of the allergen, special attention should be given to new or recently changed medication, insect stings, new environmental exposures, even as moving apartments or houses, food history, drug administration and food that was consumed. The history should include the exposure to potential allergens for hours before the reaction because in some cases a late phase anaphylaxis can occur. Anaphylaxis can be divided into two major groups. The IgE mediated form, which is the true anaphylaxis, that requires an initial contact for the sensitization of the immune system to it. The coating of the mast cells and basophils by IgE and the sudden explosive release of chemical mediators in repeated contact to the allergen. The other form is the non-IgE mediated form, also called anaphylactoid reaction. It is similar to the true anaphylaxis, but an IgE immune reaction is not required. It is caused by direct stimulation of the mast cells and basophils, but the same chemical mediators are released, which have the same effect on the body. This reaction can happen in the first contact to an allergen, so no sensitization is required. Let's now talk about the treatment of anaphylaxis. So first, how do we identify it? The letters A, B, C, D and E help us. So airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. Airway. Can the patient talk? If the patient is able to talk, their airways are free. 
and no further assessment of this step is usually necessary. If the patient cannot talk, we have to check for signs that the airways are obstructed. Those include cyanosis, labored breathing, decrease in breath sounds or wheezing. Also check the oral cavity and see if the cause might be a foreign body, blood in the airways or vomit. Breathing. Check for the patient's respiratory rate. For an adult it should be between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. For a child between 16 and 30, the younger the child, the higher the respiratory rate. We can also check for the oxygen saturation. A normal saturation should be between 92 and 100 percent. Circulation. Here we want to check the patient's pulse, which should be between 70 and 100 for an adult, and between 110 and 160 for a newborn. During anaphylaxis, the heart rate usually increases, but the pulse might appear weaker. Disability. Here we check for the patient's level of consciousness. So is the patient alert, verbal, in pain or unresponsive? A more detailed assessment can be done by the use of the Glasgow Coma Scale. Exposure. Here we want to check for a rash, angioedema and maybe if some potential allergen is in the vicinity of the patient. An ejection of epinephrine intramuscularly is usually the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis, as it is quickly absorbed and has a quick systemic effect. For a child less than 6 years, 150 microgram are used. For a child between 6 and 12 years, 300 microgram are used. For a child over 12 years and adults, 500 microgram are used. Experienced physicians can also give epinephrine intravenously. Also, usually intravenous fluids are given for a child 20 ml per kilogram, for an adult usually between 500 to 1000 ml. Also, chlorophenamine and hydrocortisone are given either intramuscularly or intravenously. The exact dosages may vary between the guidelines and they might be updated again, so please refer to the most updated guidelines for the hospital. That's it for this video, I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much and hopefully see you again in the next video.